Uh, the following presentation is a, uh, a bridge version of the um, presentation that I delivered around Australia in the last month and a half uh, at some 28 Walpole events. Um, I wanted to use this opportunity to uh, digitally present uh, this and expose it to a few, few more people than uh, who got to see it around Australia. First thing I would like to talk about is the Eastern Market Indicator. Some uh, six years ago I was appointed CEO of the company. One of the things that I, I wanted back then was to be able to say that we had a four-digit Eastern Market Indicator. For most of my working life in the Australian wool industry, I've had a three-digit market indicator and I certainly wanted to see it uh, you know, up in the order of $10 a kilogram and staying over $10 a kilogram. We've been pretty lucky in the last five years and it certainly has been above uh, $10 a kilogram, uh, but, but, but it's become very apparent that $10 a kilogram is keeping wool growers in, there, in, uh, in growing wool and uh, we're going to need it higher than that. We're certainly going to need it above $12 a kilogram. As I speak to you today, it is above $12 a kilogram and certainly in the next uh, three year period, strategic period, we forecast it to be in the order of $12 a kilogram or above. The following slide is a, a summary in bandwidths of five years of the Eastern Market Indicator over that period. You can see there that uh, in the 90s, in the stockpile period, uh, 90 to 95, moving from there into 95 to 2000, the Eastern Market Indicator actually fell by 55 cents. Uh, for the rest of the uh, uh, periods uh, shown on this slide, you can see that it has gone up, but in particular in the last five years, it's had a significant jump, $3.71. Three, $3 we can we can basically time that directly with the with the return to um, marketing in the northern hemisphere. In October 2010, we returned to robust levels of marketing in the northern hemisphere. Of course, superfine and ultrafine wool prices and superfine and ultrafine wool growers haven't been remunerated for their efforts over the last uh, little period. Anyway, the last three years, there's a number of reasons um, uh, for this, but. Predominantly, it comes down to the oversupply of these microns. Our marketing strategies that are rolled out around the world aren't particularly focused at any one particular micron. Uh, we've simply focused them at apparel wool. Um, for superfine and ultrafine wool, uh, it's a perfect storm. In the last uh, 10 year period, uh, not only is processing gone against them, but also supply increase has meant that there's a huge uh, supply of the superfine and ultrafine wools on the market. Um, in terms of processing, uh, a few things have gone against um, superfine and ultrafine wool growers. The first is the advent of compact spinning, which allows uh, processors to tuck, tuck yarns up and produce things that they haven't produced before, much, much finer cloth uh, with uh, coarser micro. The other thing, of course, is silicons and decatizing treatments. Decatizing has advanced um, hugely in the last uh, 10 years and all these things have moved against superfine and ultrafine wool growers. Of course cost of production, a lot of, a lot of people will say uh, sure wool prices have increased but the cost of production has increased as well. Absolutely um, and, and this slide here shows how uh, cost of production has um, uh, grown in that period of the last uh, of the last 13 years, but also um, uh, so so dramatically has the Eastern Market Indicator. And um, the only real database that we see is credible in this area, because of all wool growers' um, uh, cost of production is different, is the Home Sackett database, which is robust in terms of size, and um, uh, and they're about the only one that we use. You can see here that um, cost of production uh, over that last. 13-year uh, period has grown by 0.72 of a percent, but the Eastern Market Indicator has outgrown uh, that particular figure and is uh, ranging at two, a little over 2 percent per annum. Um, if you look, if you looked or analysed the last five years, I think you would find that that's more dramatic. The expenditure ratios um, that we spend to, uh, as stipulated in the statutory funding agreement, are on a 60-40 basis, 60% towards marketing, 40% towards R&D. We get a lot of um, uh, attention over this. Um, the next slide I will show you will, will indicate uh, the growth in the amount of money that has gone, to, gone towards um, R&D over the last six years. 
But in the last 12 months, um, the ratios have come out at 62%, 24% for on-farm research and 14% towards off-farm research. You can see there uh, the pie chart on the right-hand side of the screen are the exact dollars that have gone towards these particular uh, endeavours. You can see in the following slide that the real dollars gone towards R&D has increased by 220%. We'll continue to endeavour to grow R&D. Um, we think that we can maintain these types of uh, levels of uh, funding towards this particular endeavour. We have certainly no plans to decrease the amount of money going towards R&D. The following slide uh, is complex, but um, is important that wool growers see it. This is a slide uh, that I started back in 2012 when I was on the road shows back then. I wanted to show wool growers what the next three year strategic period looks like. And, and as I stand here today, I want to show wool growers what the next three year period looks like. Um, the other columns you'll notice there are the budget columns, which is the actual budget that we resolve to expedite in any one year. Of course, that can change from year to year. And then the red uh, figures are actual figures, audited figures from PricewaterhouseCoopers. So what we promised, what we said we'd do, and what we did, and the three columns um, are documented there. On a horizontal level, you can see there the assumptions, uh, the Easter market indicator, the volume and the yield. Certainly see that uh, in the next three year period we're, we're forecasting an Easter market indicator in the range of 1200 cents a kilogram. The volume of wool we're forecasting at 340 million kilograms. We think it could be just slightly less than that, but that's the figure that we're putting at the moment. Because we're talking about greasy kilograms at 340 million kilograms, we've got to put in a yield and the average yield in the Australian wool clip is 63.6. If we go down a bit further, you can see there uh, back in 2012-13, um, the opening equity of the company was 103.4 million. Um, at that point, wool growers said that that was too much uh, to have in the bank. And our board actually agreed with that and put in place a program to draw down on those reserves um, in the current strategic period, which we've done. The intangible equity mentioned there at $10 million is the value of the wool mark. The wool mark came to us at $10 million, um, so we, we can only value it at $10 million. Every year we look to impair that asset, however. Uh, should, we, sh sh should that asset ever get sold on to someone else at a higher price, then they can value at a higher price. But it came to us at $10 million, and that's the figure we must value it. There is a line in there called untouchable reserves. Because zero is always an option, and we're happy that zero is an option at every wool pole every three years, there's a chance the business could be shut down. And it's prudent for the board of AWI to keep some, uh, keep some reserves aside for the winding up of the business. Now we have contracts uh, held within the business that go out three, five, seven, and, and one that goes out nine years. In the advent of a zero vote being returned, and we don't think that will happen, um, then the company must be wound up and those contractual commitments must be uh, seen out. That's why we keep uh, a line in there for untouchable reserves. That figure uh, is, is forecast to be $40 million a year for the next three year period. In that uh, figure also, or in that calculation also, is a figure that uh, is uh, that goes towards exotic animal disease response. We've got a $5 million figure in there that goes towards exotic animal disease response. That leaves us with net available reserves. Um, and that's the figure that the, the board of AWI focuses on. We did this table at a number of different levels. We modelled it at half a percent, we modelled it at one percent, we modelled it at one and a half percent to two and a half. Um, and and factored in those assumptions and factored in the closing equity or the net available reserves at the end of that period. The focus was to draw down on those reserves to the point of 15 million uh, and the board settled on 16.6 million as, closing, uh, as the net available reserves at the end of the next strategic period. I want to talk a little bit now about the operations of the company. The company currently has 145 employees around the world. I show you this slide because it was a slide I used at the AGM last year when we had 163. At that point, I warranted that I would reduce the number of staff uh, in, in the last financial year by 20 people, and that's exactly what we've done. 
Uh, as you can see, most of the company are women, 60, in excess of 60% are women. And um, I, I was recently asked, well, what about my executive? I think with my executive, it'd be more like 70% are women. Um, we like that. That's not by, d done by design or it's done by destiny. Um, certainly the other uh, thing that does worry me a little bit is that the average age of the company is 39. Now, an average figure like that it sounds pretty good. But we have a lot of people between 45 and 65, and we have a lot of people between 20 and 30. Uh, so there's a real void there between uh, 30 and uh, 45, which is some employment continuity that was, that was neglected some years ago, uh, which we're trying to fill. I want to now talk about the marketing activities of the company. In the last 12 months, we've spent a bit of energy and time on creating some new brand architecture for the business. And the first area that we looked at was our licensing brands. We wanted to clean them up and make sure that they were repeatable and well understood by the customer. The licensing business of AWI is growing. For the first time in nearly 20 years, uh, we are not seeing any reductions in licensing, uh, either in volume or value. The value is growing, the volume is growing uh, of licensees. This is good. We think within the next five years, the value of revenue coming from licensing uh, will exceed the government revenue that's, that's, that's coming in. One area of business that a lot of people don't know about is the washing machine manufacturers that are using the Walmart license. Eight out of the top ten world's washing machines use this brand as, a, as the wash cycle and that's something we're very proud of. Of course the revenue that comes from this is on a per washing machine basis, not on a per license basis. The Walmart also got a bit of a look at this year. Um, originally the Woolmark had the words pure new wool attached to them um, and that is the essence of the brand that dates back to 1964 and it was done to demonstrate that it was virgin wool. Of course uh, as marketing people get to have a look at this uh, they want to change it. And the words Woolmark were put underneath the Woolmark uh, sometime in the 80s. I, I felt that that really promoted the company not the fibre and I wanted to revert back to the essence of the brand, which was pure new wool. We also felt that the words pure new wool might prompt some of those young consumers to think that there's a new type of wool out there, something that, something that they haven't seen before and they might want to go and have a look at. So the branding architecture around that logo will now revert to pure new wool. The other logo is the gold wool mark and the green wool mark, that's been used in the campaign for wool will also uh, have the embellishment taken off them and they will revert to just a very clean coloured mechanism. There's two ways our marketing strategies are rolled out. The first one is direct to consumer and they are the International Walmart Prize and the Campaign for Wool. They deal at drawing attention from the consumer directly. Uh, they are event based, stunt based, PR based campaigns uh, that aim at getting column inches. Every newspaper, every magazine in the world has a different value on the column inch that you acquire. Um, and acquiring it comes in three different ways. You can either pay for advertising, you can either pay for advertorial, or you can either get editorial. And our, these campaigns, the International Walmart Prize and the Campaign for Wool, are aimed at attracting editorial, which is the highest value uh, of, of attention you can get in a magazine or a newspaper. The other programs deal directly with brands and retailers. Our aim is to focus our marketing attention towards their customer. Only those retailers and brands know their customer. Uh, the staff around the world are under really strict instructions not to walk into these businesses and tell them, tell them how to market their product. They know their consumer really well and it's only up to us to uh, to follow their lead on wh in which direction they'd like the marketing activities to go. I don't care whether they want uh, pages in magazines or windows or point of sale material. It's very important that we focus it in the direction that they want. Of course all our marketing activities with these companies is, is, is well leveraged at a minimum of four to one. We're not going to we're not going to invest uh, in a marketing strategy with a retailer unless he's got at least four of his dollars in for every one of ours, and often this gets up towards twenty to one. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the marketing strategies now and and how they've worked for us. The first one is the campaign for wool. This is a program that started in January two thousand and ten. 
uh, it was instigated by the Prince of Wales. So he instigated a program for, called the Campaign for Wool. He remains the patron of the Campaign for Wool, and you can see here um, him dedicating some of his time at his house. Uh, this is an event uh, a year ago where he buried wool garments and he buried poly polyester garments in his garden. In a year's time, we'll dig them up and, and uh, naturally the wool garment will have uh, biodegraded and the polyester one is likely not to have uh, disintegrated at all. This is a typical example of an event-based or a stunt-based program. You'll also see on the bottom of that slide uh, a band there that, that talks about the cost of the project, cost, talks about also the FTEs, the full-time equivalents, that's four, the number of partners involved in that particular program, 445, and the benefit cost analysis at $4.80. At AWI, we've commissioned an external agency that spends three days a week uh, working within AWI and valuing all our projects. One by one, he is working through the projects and the programs. He assesses them before, during, and after their completion. And, and a, a 10 to 15 page docu document is written up for every program the company's got. Those programs are then posted on the website. Good, bad, or indifferent, we put that up as to what that benefit cost analysis is. And you can see in the case of the campaign for wool here, is $4.80 return for every $1 of wool growers funds spent. The next marketing program I want to talk about is the International Wool Market Prize. This has been by far our most successful marketing strategy. Uh, it's a program that was brought to me four years ago, um, and it was based on an idea of a wool award that was originally instigated in 1954. The two first winners of this were Yves Saint Laurent and Karl Lagerfeld. And I want to show you now a video of uh, the, the wrap up of this year's regional awards. On an annual basis, we conduct six regional awards. The winners of that go into an international final. The change that we've made to this program is that we don't just dish out a trophy and a check. We also make sure that the winner of this program gets to merchandise their goods in 12 of the best retailers around the world. We have participating in this Bergdorf Goodman, Saks Fifth Avenue, Harvey Nichols, Joyce, David Jones, to name a few. These are the very best retailers that we can find and guarantees the winner of this prize an opportunity to not only trade their merchandise in their own country, their home country, but launch them onto the international stage. Do you know, I think that it's great. I think that it gives emerging talent from wherever you're from in the world an incredible opportunity. And that is the great thing about Walmart. Design has to start from design. And sometimes we live in such a commercial world that in a weird way we forget the importance of design. And for me, good collection and good designers have to start from true and innovative and provocative and interesting design. And then the commercial world should follow from there. I think the Walmart price for this region is actually really important. I think it puts the idea of new talent on the map. And I think that's something really, which I really love about it. You know, I think there's so many innovative uses of wool, both for how the wool's treated, uh, meaning what's been applied to it or how it's been processed, to just thinking about all the technical properties that are innate to wool. So I found that intriguing to think about it all because we take part of it for granted when you've been doing it for a while but it also kind of made me think about a little bit more about even pushing that even further as well myself. What I think sets the winner apart is really their confidence and also their understanding of their own business. You know, it's great seeing somebody who will be starting you know, at a young age and having such a, a straight, confident direction. I think it's very exciting because you, you never deviate. And it will be probably the biggest challenge I've ever faced and definitely the most rewarding experience. The next program I want to talk about is No Finer Feeling. This program on, on all levels performs. Um, we, we started with no partners. We now have something like 86 that have either participated in it in the past or are participating in it. Uh, it continues to perform for us and 
uh, serve the company well in terms of uh, promoting the wool fibre in the Northern Hemisphere. All our strategies are focused about selling fibre in the North, Northern Hemisphere, profiling not only our logo, but profiling the fibre. We think our marketing strategies are performing quite well, but what we wanted to do is ask our partners overseas. So in the last six months, we've collected video footage of some 30 partners, international people, uh, the highest profile retailers and brands from around the world. And we asked them uh, how our marketing strategies are performing. We can put all the measurement on these uh, in terms of column inches and benefit cost analysis. But the real test of our worth is how they believe our strategies are going. And I want to play you a video now that articulates that uh, from the horse's mouth. Wool is uh, our blood and everything that represents the company. With the promotions for wool at the moment, they're good because working with people like myself who have solid businesses but also a designer a label as well. The wool market has been uh, a trouble in the last uh, 10 years, but now I think is an expected to be one of the most important targets for the future. I think it's incredible the way that the Walmart company has got right into the heart of the fashion industry. You go to things now and everywhere you go, you feel that people are pushing the story of merino wool. There has been more consumption of wool. You see in a lot of fashion houses that wool is being consumed at the moment. We're by far the largest, as I would say, retailer in terms of the usage of wool. Now, wool stays very important for our menswear. We're talking about coats, we're talking about suits, we're talking about knitwear. Even into women's wear, you see more and more utilization of wool. It is actually, it's our preferred. China is becoming a big market for us. Very, very large pool of people with a lot of money. They quite often don't understand what they're buying, they want to buy the best. We need to tell them and explain to them why wool is so good. And once they get it, they have the power to buy it and buy it in a big way. Particularly with our 100 stores in, in PRC China, the Walmart gold symbol is now a real mark of authenticity. The campaign for wool was a great boost for us because it brought um, all of, sort of wool's attributes and qualities out into the sort of public realm, but in a fun way. Since we've had sheep wandering down Savile Row to setting on fire garments and duvet covers at Clarence House by His Royal Highness Prince Charles, the interest in wool has been quite amazing. A lot of younger designers use wool in incredibly different and varied ways. The Walmart Prize has been key in elevating Australian fashion. I think that Walmart are, are doing a wonderful thing supporting young designers and not just from Britain or Europe. You know, this is a whole world. Sportswear, casual wear is where we see the future because not only is the trend for a mature men but it's a way to get a younger consumer. I think everything has been done in the right direction because you push very strongly on communication. We are reaching the consumer, which is the most important thing. But I have to thank all the farmers for what they are doing about the wool, because I know that it's very difficult to, to grow sheep, such a kind of, of, of quality, and I know that these moments are tough. We must continue to improve or promote wool around the world and the best wool, to maintain wool the max noble of the fibres in the world. I want to talk a little bit about the on-farm research portfolio. Not many board meetings go by without the board um, banging on the table about wild dogs and shearer wool handler training. We've invested a considerable amount of money in these uh, particular portfolios. In particular with wild dogs, we have um, uh, now regional coordinators, two in New South Wales, two in Victoria, one in Queensland, one in Western Australia, one in South Australia. We also fund a national uh, coordinator. We have, we have work that's been um, progressed with the Invasive Animal CRC in the area of an alternative to 1080. We have uh, 98 local groups under funding around Australia. We're really keen to try and find some, some more 
uh, opportunity in this space. And just recently I've commissioned a forum to be held in Longreach, Queensland, uh, where we will talk to wool growers up there about other things that we can do in this area. Shearer and Wool Handler Training is another uh, area that we're really keen to progress. We've had some success with the TAFEs around Australia, uh, but as the state governments pull their funds out of that area, they're expecting us to fill that void. Uh, we have uh, recently commissioned our own in shed uh, trainers. Uh, we'll continue to expand our own in shed training activity. Uh, but uh, there's no doubt that this area uh, is an important area for the company. With regard to robotics and delivery systems, I think that um, in the past there's been a huge amount of money invested in robotics. Um, we do have some interesting concepts about delivering animals. There's a huge amount of energy expended in going into the pen, turning the animal over, dragging it out and getting into position before you engage the down tube and start shearing. And shearing. And we want to make sure that um, everything's explored in the area of delivery systems, two in particular that are out of Western Australia that we're looking at rather closely. Lifetime U management, in terms of the benefit cost analysis uh, work that's done at the company, is yielding the best. It's yielding a 44 to 1 return for wool growers. This is exceptional. Recently, uh, we've converted it, digitally converted it, uh, to iOS devices and Android devices. Uh, that product is commercially available. We continue to underwrite the cost of that program. Buckle Meloxicam is a piece of research that we've been undertaking with Sydney University. This particular piece of chemistry acts very quickly and provides the animal with preoperative analgesia. We're doing a lot of work in this area. We get asked a lot about what's happening uh, as in this space of alternatives for mulesing. We certainly have uh, progressed skin traction all the way through the APVMA. We're now working with the commercial the commercial company that we brought along through this process to ensure that they do commercialise that particular product. The other thing that we have underway is two other pieces of uh, work, one in using liquid nitrogen and the other one using lasers uh, that, that are, that's moving along quite nicely. We actively engage the animal welfare groups uh, around Australia and bring them into the company and and provide them with updates of the research that's being undertaken. We are doing what we should be doing, and that's the R&D for the Australian wool industry. We also get off once a year to the Northern Hemisphere just before the selling system over there starts in September and brief the National Retail Federation and the British Retail Consortium. The following is a piece of work that we've undertaken with uh, MLA. It's a technology out of the UK uh, that applies a small amount of analgesia around the elastrator and offers the animal some pain relief when it comes to uh, castoration and tail docking. Two years ago I asked that uh, we combine all the education, extension, adoption and delivery uh, tasks that the company's been undertaking into one portfolio and one portfolio manager. This has worked rather well and you can see here if you look at a timeline from the age of 5 to plus 30, then we've got a huge amount of activities happening in the on-farm area. Um, but there are some holes, and naturally you can see their circle is a hole between about 7 and 17. Um, and that's an area of focus in the next uh, three-year strategic period. One of the projects I'd like to talk about and show you a video on is the National Merino Challenge. This has been a phenomenal success for the company. It's grown from 50 to 100, to 150, and we think in the next few years it's going to grow to 200 uh, students participating in it. The faces that I'm about to show you are the faces that we should be bringing through this particular industry. They are the human resources that are going to continue on and fill the spaces that we leave when we uh, depart the industry. I've found the National Merino Challenge a really great opportunity to network with people within the industry and other people doing similar subjects to what I do, which is agricultural science. I met a girl from Western Australia today and then another one from Armadale. So I think coming to something like this is outstanding if you want a career in wool. The reason I wanted to be involved with the National Merino Challenge was the thrill of the competition, but also to catch up with other young, passionate people in the industry. This is my third year attending the competition. The Merino Challenge has been really valuable in showcasing sheep and wool again and making it in the forefront of young people's minds, so keen to bring students every year. I reckon it's been a fantastic program, very well set up, and all the people who have put in their time to um, come and teach it, they've been very good about it. I'm in year 12 at the moment, 
So it's all coming to an end and I thought this National Merino Challenge has been a great opportunity to come and just finalise all my knowledge and gain more knowledge for my upcoming HSE. I enjoyed learning about the pricing of wool. That kind of opened my mind up a bit to how much more there is to the industry. I think there's sometimes a bit of disconnect with young people coming through into our industry and I wanted to help bridge that gap. It's more than just a competition, it's a great educational experience to chat with other passionate young people in the wool industry and it can really invigorate you to keep doing what you're doing and see that there's a very bright future in wool. The area I want to talk about now is 10x innovation. I'm of the belief in the next three years we're going to have to make some quantum leaps. Of course, incremental innovation always has to, has to happen and has to occur at the company and will continue to occur. But amongst, scattered amongst the incremental innovation, we must have some 10x innovations. For three years now, we've had two app developers on staff. We're now moving those, those gentlemen into areas of software development and ag automation, which is going to be a big feature of our next strategic intent document. You'll see here an app that's been developed, uh, which is to track shearers and wool handlers. We used to get that information on a piece of paper from the TAFEs around Australia and I felt that it was important that we have, have a better mechanism to record all that information and, and deliver it digitally back to the company so that we can keep track of who's trained, where they were trained and where they've gone to. Another app developed in-house is an app that helps uh, navigate around a, a product called the Wool Lab. The Wool Lab is our trend forecasting guide that's rolled out around the world. It's a physical document that has something like 300 different fabrics in it. Those fabrics, when shown to brand and retailers, has certainly garnered a lot of attention. One thing we wanted to do was make sure that everyone had access to this, and the only way we could do that is digitalise this through an app. This allows the, the person using that app to, to browse like they would a physical document, to select their fabrics, to choose it and put it on their mood board, and then send an email directly to the supplier and ask for those samples. These are all things that we can track through this digital application. We felt that it was important that we provide some extra tools to wool growers so they can do a bit more remotely. One of the areas is farm automation. There's certainly a lot of things that can be actuated uh, remotely, providing you have the connectivity. The connectivity is something that Australia, because it's so vast, is challenged with all the time. In a standard environment like an office or a house, you have Wi-Fi range of about seven metres. What we wanted to do is find a technology that could cast Wi-Fi signals out seven kilometres. We engaged a company in North America called Zigbee and have been working with them for a long time on developing tools that can cast that signal out and then cast it on, uh, sell that signal on from that uh, module another seven kilometres. So we can go out seven and then on another seven and then on another seven. Every one of those actuators or modules will be able to actuate three things. Turn on a pump, turn off a pump. Turn on a solenoid, turn off a solenoid. Or even send a signal from a weather station or a piece of video. I'd like to think that, what, that, that one day in the future, wool growers, through the uh, use of their mobile phone, can control what's happening back at the farms. Whether they be in town or away on holidays, they can see what's happening on their farm and control what's happening on the farm. We think this is not too far beyond the realms of possibility and are certainly working hard to provide that connectivity to wool growers. Wool goes into two areas predominantly at the moment. It goes into either knitwear or tailored apparel like this suit. We think that there's a lot of white space. There's some areas where wool should be uh, but isn't at the moment and where we don't compete at all. We want to provide wool growers with more opportunity, not less opportunity. And one of the areas that we've been focusing on is developing some windproof, waterproof garments. In the 90s, there was a technology invented to stretch wool fibre. It was done because great premiums were being paid for fine wool at that point. So this, this machine called an Optum machine stretched fibre from 19 micron to 17, or 17 to 15. But as we know, the supply of superfine and ultrafine wool has grown dramatically, and we don't need extra quantity of this product at the moment. I inherited two machines in 2010, and we couldn't sell them. We couldn't even sell them for scrap. I moved those machines off to China and did some research to see what other products we could develop. The product we developed 
is a windproof, waterproof garment. What it does do is it stretches the fibre and temporarily sets it there, not permanently sets it. We weave it into a very dense weave structure and then we use steam to relax it. So without a membrane, without a silicon, without any polymer on it, we've created a windproof, waterproof garment which allows us to compete in this space of anoraks and shell garments. All these garments shown here are $800 garments. We think that there's a huge opportunity for them in this area, as we do with below-the-waist casualisation. Below-the-waist casualisation is, is a great white space for us. Our work with Levi's has yielded a product that is now being adopted by many, many other retailers around the world. We were able to produce a wool denim product that was cost effective and much cheaper than the previous wool denim developed in the 90s. It allowed us to use off the shelf wool yarns and off the shelf cotton yarns and simply uh, blend those in a structural blend rather than an intimate blend and deliver them to retailers at a price comparable with cotton denim. The other area it allows us to get into not only in shell garments and anoraks but also into an area that we've lost. One of the areas that we've lost is trench coats. Trench coats used to be all made out of wool and have moved to cotton. This allows us to get back into that space as well. Another partnership we've been working really hard on is our partnership with Adidas in, in Europe. We've got a unique opportunity there. We've got a champion of, of wool within that company that's really promoting wool rather hard in terms of product development and taking new things to market. The product you see here is an Ultra Boost wool runner. This product has just gone to market in the Northern Hemisphere across a number of different regions. We expect it to be very successful. Uh, it comes in a few different colours. We expect this to be a great success. Another product we've been working on with Adidas is a Primer Knit tee. You can see here it's photographed on some athletes that competed at the World Athletics Conference in Beijing recently. The Wool Selling System Review was commissioned by AWI. It was done for a couple of reasons. The first one was, I felt that wool growers deserved more options than just one to sell their wool. Some people out there will say that there's every option you need to sell your wool. The fact remains that 95% of the Australian wool clip sells through one mechanism. So although there might be other alternatives, they haven't been well explained or they haven't been well understood. I wanted to understand the transaction between the first owner and the second owner. I wanted to make sure that there was enough competition around that transaction. I wanted to make sure that there weren't some costs that we couldn't take out of that transaction. I wanted to make sure that if there were costs that were being charged elsewhere, but ultimately being paid for by wool growers, that those costs were well disclosed. I commissioned the following gentlemen to undertake this. Those gentlemen are Graham Samuel, the ex-head of the ACCC, Bernie Wonder, the ex-head of the Productivity Commission, Will Wilson, an ex-director of the Australian Futures Exchange, Jamie Lilly, who's a wool broker and an exporter. We needed that uh, local knowledge on there. And Colin Bell, who's a businessman in Sydney and is also uh, the owner of FS Faulkner Banook, Wanganella, Zara, and a few other properties around that R Riverina area. I wanted to get the best productivity and competition minds on this I could. And these are the gentlemen that are doing it. AWI has no seat on this panel. It has an executive officer that looks after this group. The board of AWI have no seat on this panel. This document has called for submissions in December. It then put out a discussion paper. It's called for more submissions in the last couple of months. And now they're in the process of completing this and writing a report for the board of AWI to review. We expect this will be delivered at the November board meeting and will be made public in December. The last slide I have is just a wrap up of, of Woolpole. We certainly are very proud of the constitution of the company and the structure of the company that allows wool growers to vote every three years. We like that. We like that also that zero is an option. In fact, some of the directors of AWI were instrumental in getting that in place. There are 44,000 eligible levy payers. All those levy payers, uh, we, we encourage to vote. Every three years when we do a wool poll, we must, prior to that, do a review of performance. And we've done that this year. That's part of our statutory funding agreement. The review of performance was undertaken by Deloitte's private. They resolved that AWI had returned to wool growers. It returned $2.90 for every dollar invested. 
We'll poll open on the 14th of September. It closes on the 30th of October. The amount of votes that are usually tendered is extremely good. Every year we commission an independent wool poll panel. They oversee the preparation of the voter information memorandum and the voter information kit. The aim of these documents is to make sure that we take that 40 and 60 per cent up to 45 and 65. And certainly we're working very hard to make sure that happens. Regardless of how you're going to vote, we encourage you to get out and vote. And make sure that if you're seeing a neighbour or catching up for dinner with a friend uh, that's also a wool grower, then you encourage them to vote. We're certainly keen to make sure that you have your say in the next three year strategic period and how your money's spent.